this time I will uh, recognize Representative Valancourt. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Steve Valancourt. I represent Manchester, Ward 8, home of the Manchester, Boston Regional Airport. Um, and I thought I was here today because you got sick of talking about that guy named Reggie and wanted to talk about people like Emerson and Thoreau and Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau and civil disobedience and things like that. Uh, I did come to speak in particular about the section of the bill which uh, you thought originally you might not want to get into, but section two, the Real ID bill. And I guess I could throw even more confusion into the loop by saying that I'm not even sure it should be transportation or judiciary, but that the second committee might be state and federal relations. Because quite clearly, we've gone beyond the role of a driver's license and have come into the role where state and federal authority bump up against each other. But I, like Representative Kirk, believe that no matter what you do, the House will strip that section out and vote against it. Um, the great Roman orator Cicero said, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. I don't think any of us here want to be children, and with due respect to the governor's representative, I think he only told you part of the story about what occurred before we were here today. It is, of course, true that this House, on a snowy day last year, voted 268 to 9 to not comply with Real ID, but it didn't begin there. It began with one of the greatest speeches I have ever heard in my 12 years in the House three years ago when Representative Kirk got up on the floor and spoke, quoting, Patrick Henry from his Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, in which Patrick Henry took responsibility for the civil disobedience he was about to under, undertake. Uh, and in that vote, Representative Kirk managed to turn around, I believe it was a unanimous vote against getting out of real ID, and the House overwhelmingly went for it. And then the Senate with Judd Gregg's people descending upon us. I met, remember they were stationed outside the Senate President's office, Senate President Gatsas at the time, talked the Senate into disobeying the will of the House, and the Senate affirmed Real ID. And then, of course, many of those senators were voted out of office. I'm not saying that was the reason why, but that's the story before the part that the governor's representative got to. Real ID, opposition to it, is in the history of New Hampshire, in the history of New England, and the shot heard around the world. But, you know, we shouldn't labor under the assumption that if we have civil disobedience, there will be no penalty. That's why, Representative Barry, I thought what you talked about was very important, whether the word is extension or exemption. I don't think I was befuddled by the governor's representative because he said that this is the same as what they've done. It's not the same. Clearly, line 16 uses the word extension here. If they are asking for an extension, it is changing the will of this body. You can't ask to extend something you've decided not to go along with. So this bill does not do what has already been done. If they've already asked for an exemption, fine. Hip, hip, hooray. If they're asking for an extension, they are overruling the will of this body, and I must say the will of the governor's own signature. You know, when um, talking about civil disobedience and the repercussions that derive from civil disobedience, I think you probably know of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And Thoreau, of course, wrote the book on civil disobedience. He also wrote uh, Walden Pond, and he went to jail at one point for civil disobedience. And I believe his transcendental friend, and I, I know you wanted to get into political philosophy rather than Reggie, <laughs> but his transcendental friend Emerson came in and said, you know, Henry, what are you doing in there behind bars? And Thoreau's response was, Ralph or Waldo or whoever he called him, what are you doing out there? In other words, there comes a time that it's so important that you should stand up and you should say what you are doing is inherently wrong and we're going to defy you. We're going to defy you, George III, said Patrick Henry. We're going to defy you, federal government, said the citizens of New Hampshire with this bill. And tying this into the science <coughs> committee that you are, I thought there was probably one person that more than any other comes into this breach between science 
and political philosophy. And I've handed you a little quote from a gentleman that probably reaches this. Albert Speer was the scientist of the Third Reich, the architect of the Third Reich. And whenever we talk about civil disobedience and the need for civil disobedience, we should talk about the Third Reich because there wasn't enough civil disobedience there. But Albert Speer was the scientist. And just before he was sentenced to 20 years in Spandau prison, in 1946, he did serve the time and get out and lived another 15 years after that, by the way. And a lot of the uh, prosecutors at Nuremberg thought he was the best Nazi. But he warned the tribunal, and I think this comes into the junction between science and political philosophy. And I've kind of uh, highlighted it for you. He said, today the danger of being terrorized by technocracy threatens every country in the world. In five or ten years, the te technique of warfare will make it possible to fire rockets from continent to continent with uncanny precision. A new large-scale war uh, will prevent unfettered, uh, a new, will end the destruction of human culture and civilization. Nothing can prevent unfettered engineering and science from completing the work of destroying human beings. Obviously, he was talking about the nuclear holocaust that we have seen could well come about. But I think when you're talking in science in terms of putting a little chip in something that can follow my every movement and Big Brother can follow me from the time I leave my house in the morning to the time I get back at night, we can say to ourselves, yes, maybe we have the technology to do it. But do we want to do it? Do we want to do real ID? I think not. And I think it's important for those of us in New Hampshire to tell the rest of the country that. And since I quoted Cicero and Thoreau and other people, my favorite line in the English language comes from Shakespeare, and it's from the oration in Julius Caesar. And it says, uh, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. I suggest if New Hampshire knuckles under to real ID, that evil will live after us. If we are able to successfully rebel against it, it will be interred with our bones but that would be a better place than having evil made manifest. I thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Chairman, and I suggest that people that are so scientifically oriented have the brain power to do with the philosophical, political arguments as well. <laughs> uh, Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere we see him in chains. Would you say that this is an electronic method of adding to the chains? Although I generally don't agree with Rousseau, because he was a champion of statism over individual rights, I think that quote he was accurate about. <laughs> but I'm very anti-Rousseau in other areas. I think he was one of the first fascist philosophers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.